Okay, so communities then are going to be the better way for you to reach an audience because this is that essence of that of that captive audience. And uh, not only do I teach here at, and at other colleges, as I've said before, I'm also part of a company that we do this stuff for clients. We do websites, we do apps, we do social media, we do photography, all of that stuff. And when I do this, or anyone on my team, when we are going to promote some company's upcoming event, we do it on Twitter and Google Plus and Facebook, the big ones. And we often see the biggest impact comes from Google Plus when we use the aspects of communities. Now, if we want to invest, if we actually do want to pay um, and to reach more of an audience, then Facebook definitely wins. But if I'm on a budget, <coughs> I don't want to spend. Uh, Google Plus is going to be one of the best ways to reach an audience for free. And again, personally, anecdotally, I've done tests where I post the exact same content to all the networks and I often get the best results on communities. Because these are collections of people that really care about a topic. Yes, there's always spammers and spam bots and fake companies and all of that on all the social networks. But I, I don't really see that as a big, uh, as bad as Twitter. Twitter, I think, has a lot more of a problem with spam. Uh, I still like Twitter a lot, uh, but I see on Google Plus it's a, it's 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 better because again the moderators. There are people. Someone created this community, and therefore one or more moderators are hanging around, doing nothing all day long except checking what's going on here and removing the bad stuff. And again, these are not endorsed or created by Google. Uh, so my point of saying this is that I'm showing us this, but I'm not saying for you to go to these communities and start to post every single day, check out my app, check out my app, check out my app. Some moderator is going to say, hey, you're spamming. That's the best case scenario. Worst case scenario, your, uh, your post is removed. Worst, worst case scenario is you are removed from the community. <laughs> And then you lost 1.8 million users. Or you get flamed. That doesn't matter. Losing the community access is worse. I can, I can take the flames. Uh, but the thing about getting kicked out then is you may have no recourse. You're done. You're out. Because the particular moderator or moderators could be pretty authoritarian. And I've tried. Uh, I've been kicked out of one community. And I thought that I was totally... Let me tell you, I thought I was totally following the rules. I thought, because uh, all of these communities, if you go into them, they're going to say rules somewhere. Community guidelines, do this, don't do that, follow these rules. I thought I was following all the rules of this community. Uh, this was a community about sharing photography of, of costumes. You know, people that go to conventions and dress up as cool, crazy things. I was sharing those kinds of photos. It seemed like the moderator of that community only wanted certain kinds of photos to be posted on his community and I wasn't posting those photos so I got kicked out and there was no way for me to get back in I went to the community of Google Plus Google Plus has a community in here to talk to the Google Plus people <coughs> themselves and I told them and I showed them screenshots this is what I was posting these are the rules I was kicked out what can you do about it and they told me we can't do anything about it these communities, as long as they are not violating the overall terms of service of Google, can do anything they want, can be run any way they want. So that one community was run by one person who was a real dictator, whereas these other ones, I haven't had any trouble with any, all the other 20 communities I'm a part of. So the point of this is, if you are going to join a community, which is my number one secret trick for all of this, join communities, but read the rules, such as no spam, and follow the rules here and be nice and you know follow the rules of the community and then you'll have access to depending on the community right off the bat 1.8 million potential people to see your app or start your own community start your own but again I don't recommend that you're not going to get people to come to your brand new community if they can go join another community with already established people uh, so You know, in this particular community, there is a location here for you to post your app. So this community, by whoever created this community, you can see the moderator somewhere here, moderators, 
they made these different sections. I'm going to share my app in the app section. I'm going to follow the rules, share it, and now potentially 1.8 million people saw it. And you saw right now, a moment ago, Sark and Jack and such, they're posting right now. They're, they're live. They are actually being active. On the flip side, let's say, okay, I'm not ready to promote my apps and such yet. I'm still learning. There are a variety of development communities you can become a part of to find help. I've gone to some of these communities and said, hey everyone, this problem here in my JavaScript is, is kicking my butt. Can you guys look at it? And then in one day, I get five answers. You know, faster than Stack Exchange. Um, for example, the Android Dev one. Is it Cordova Development uh, Community? How many uh, users? Or, or you know what? Maybe I'm looking at a, or you know, a community. This is an individual. No, there is, there is one here. Oh. I search Cordova and I see Apache Cordova Community. Oh, okay. It is in community section. 1,800 people, so a lot smaller. But still, it could be 1,800 potential people. There's also a phone gap one over here. Yeah, well, okay. And you can look in more. Usually on the first screen here, it'll show you the biggest ones, and then as you go more, you'll get smaller and smaller communities. I wouldn't recommend to get into communities of under a thousand, because, you know, here's one of Cordova plugins, 221. That might not be a viable enough community to really get a good out of it. Here's one in Spanish, Turkish, uh, Portuguese. Someone, uh, people here using Ionic in Italy, down to 82 members. When you're that low, really, I try to get into communities of at least a thousand, a thousand people, because even, even at a thousand, you can still find a lot of great people to really help and connect, and, and be a valuable resource. So communities, then we've got people and pages, so these are actual users, these are people, um, the, the, or, or a page, so a person or a business can create an account on social media. So here's a possible way to find people individually, so you can search a topic and find people. And then you're going to see posts. With these keywords, these are actual things that are being posted to Google+. And just like Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, all of these, you can share text, you can share pictures, you can share links, videos, all the stuff you can share on all the networks. So if you haven't heard of Wired, you know, they've been around 25 years by now. A tech publication, that's a big name in the world of tech, they're on Google+. Five minutes ago, they posted something. Danielle Laporte, eight minutes ago, posted this. Fandroid, one of the big names in Android, um, in the Android, you know, fan space is on here too. The point of this is that uh, you're going to share stuff on um, Google Plus and uh, people could find it. These particular things that are being posted, you know, this was sent to public, so just basically their followers. If you have very little followers, very little people will see it. Uh, if these are posted over to communities, like I'm highly recommending, you've got a built in audience. Um, so, we'll give this a shot. Uh, any questions so far? Again, again, the if you're going to be your own uh, app store, you know, your own uh, uh, your own d developer, you have to have all of these aspects: the programming side of it, the graphic side of it, the marketing side of it. That's why it's a three-month sequence. And this is just teach, uh, touching the tip of the iceberg of this. I would recommend take the 
uh, take my other marketing classes for more info, but to give this a try. How many of you currently have a Gmail email address? If you have a Gmail, we'll easily be able to sign in and then have access to this. If you don't have a Gmail, you can create an account or you can just follow along. So this will be, if you'd like to do this, I recommend you do this. I'm going to click sign in and either sign in with your Gmail or create an account. <clears throat> you create an account, it'll ask you for a bunch of info, uh, like a phone number to verify you're a real person and all of that. You can make it all up or you can simply sign in. So I'm going to go ahead and sign in. Yes, there, there should be a way. Um, let me answer that question in just a moment. Remind me in just a moment because if we go back to your Google Plus profile screen, it should be the address at the top there. I'm going to confirm that in just a moment, but let's get everyone logged in and then we'll check that. Uh, anyone having any trouble signing in or signing up if you'd like? Now the thing about Google Plus is very recently so they've been around since about 2011 or 12 or so. They were founded after Facebook and Twitter. Facebook founded in 2004, Twitter founded in 2006. They just celebrated 10 years. Google Plus, I believe 2011, maybe 2012. So they, they, they came out after those two big ones, and therefore they saw what the other networks did, and they did a variation of it, and they've been changing and evolving. Collections, for example, have been added relatively recently, and that was an innovation that they added after Pinterest, uh, because I feel that collections are a lot like Pinterest, in that there's all of these pin boards and topics to go look at. Uh, as I said, I still don't... Uh, collections are okay, but I really think communities are the big secret. And as things change, uh, the, the Google Plus interface has recently changed. So right now, you may get the classic interface, or you may get the new interface. If anywhere on screen it's telling you about get the new Google Plus interface, go ahead and select it, because eventually they're going to remove the old interface. You might as well get used to the new one. And so if you get that message about that, click Let's Go. You may get it on the bottom left corner sometimes. It says Go to New Google Plus. Or you may just right away have it. And the way that you'll know that you have it is because the design is a little bit more kind of like blocky and colorful. This is the new interface. It's the new design. It's in the latest style of the Google interface. If you don't see that, you might see in the corner, go to new Google Plus, or you can go back to the classic one. Who knows how long that'll be around. And so basically, um, I have uh, this particular account. I have home. On the left, I've got home. If you don't see a menu, it might be hidden. You can open those three lines there, the menu. You've got your home screen. So I've got a spot there to share, which we'll look at in a moment. You've got show me collections, and show me communities, show me your profile. And you're supposed to see here, profile, that's supposed to be your address. Uh, you might have, you know, this sort of gibberish address, which uh, eventually you'll be able to have a nice short address like Victor's Bakery. Uh, but if you first create your Google Plus, when you first create your Google Plus, you're going to have uh, this sort of like generic gibberish address. And eventually, as you use Google Plus, it'll then eventually pop up to say, claim your custom name. So then eventually you can have a nice short name like that. I, uh -huh. I have a client who um, they 
decided not to go with the short name because they were worried that the rights to the old content to my knowledge, that is not a problem because even deep down, once you've got the short name, deep down you still have that unique identifier. So I don't believe links should break. One way to make sure about that is to go to Communities and find the Google Plus Help community and ask them. It's good to know they have that. Yeah, and they, they are pretty responsive. If you have people follow you, how can you see who they are? If you go look on people, you will see here, find people to connect with, look at your followers, I mean, uh, look at who you are following, and look at your followers. So in this test account, I've got one follower, and I'm following uh, zero. But Google Plus has the screen of people, and also the terminology of circles. Uh, I can follow people or companies and put them into a circle which is just a way to organize them like a folder I can create let's say I'm a pet shop and I've created a pet shop uh, store on Google Plus and I've followed a bunch of people on Google Plus so that they can connect with me and then they can see when I post something of a of a product but let's say I'm posting a product uh, of cat food and so I want to target that product to just the cat people. Google Plus lets me organize my who I'm following uh, into circles. So I can make a cat people circle, a dog people circle, a birds people circle. And therefore when I share that coupon of cat food, I'll target it right to the cat people. The dog people won't see it. They don't want to see it. Uh, so. I can do that under, uh, I can organize people under people following, and I can create circles. It just has these basic built-in ones. I can create a new circle, a new way to organize people. I can call these things whatever I want. I can have one person in more than one circle. So maybe I know someone is a cat person and a dog person. Um, so I can put that person into both circles. I don't have any friends just yet to show you how that, how that works. Um, I guess let me try this. Let me follow and back. And so if I've got a if I've got people that I'm following, I can, you know, uh, I've got Anne here. When I connect, they're set as a friend, but I can uh, click there to also put them into family, put them into acquaintances, whatever. I can have people into different circles. If I want to stop following, I can just check it off. The good news is that if you create various circles and put people into it, uh, people won't know what circle they're in. They will get a notification that says, Victor's Bakery followed you. But it's not going to say, Victor's Bakery put you into the circle, annoying people. <laughs> so they won't know where you put them in. Just that you follow. That notification bell on the top there tells you that. When you log into Facebook, you see those red numbers on the top right corner. I got a new message. I got a new follower, whatever. On Google Plus, I see that here on the bell. Nothing's going on here. But uh, here, if I followed someone, they would get on their Google Plus a, a number there that they got. They got. They got a notification. They don't. They also. I just unfollowed and They don't get the notification that you unfollow people. Only when you follow someone and they don't know what circle you put them into. Uh, so again, uh, the point of what I like, why I like Google Plus a lot is communities. Uh, so if you go to communities, it might give you recommendations. These recommendations will get smarter as you use Google Plus more. So it's recommending the Android and such. If yours is recommending about fitness or photography and such, and it doesn't make sense, you have search at the top. I've recommended member and yours. Again, you can create a community. I don't recommend it because then now you've got to be a moderator. You've got to delete that spam. You've got to get people on track. You've got to put rules. Better yet, to join a community. Let me show some of the ones that I've joined that you might find valuable. So there's, of course, well, let me write it down in a notepad here, and I'll put it in the network folder. 
I like these communities. So Google plus communities. Android development. And there might be more than one. So the one I've got has 247,000 users, members. I like the CSS community. So that's a community all about people talking about CSS. 93,000 people where you can share what you know, ask questions, keep up on the latest. That's that's like that's like the old yeah, it's like Google Plus alpha version. I haven't used it very recently. I, I think it's rather passe. I think even Google thinks it's passe, and they want you to come out over, over to Google+. We've got the developing with Google+. Uh, maybe, it might not, maybe not for everyone, that one. What's this one about anyway? I forgot. Do you develop... Just one moment. Do you develop mobile or web apps? Integrate interested in the Google Plus API. This community is a place for you to meet other developers and share your tricks on that. So I guess if you want to integrate Google Plus into your app, that might be a community to get into. Question? You found that groups on the community Yes, definitely. Uh, communities definitely. Uh, for various clients, we want to build awareness for something. Awareness could lead to sales. So we find the right community or communities for the client and share stuff to those communities. And you've got that captive audience of people that care. And on a couple of clients, you know, I can pull up their, their receipts and see that a few more sales happened that week when we shared to those communities. So it, it is viable. Uh, funny pictures, not really. Uh, HTML5. Yep, I recommend that one. That one's got over a quarter of a million people. So the HTML5 community has got 274, 274,000, 373. There's an iOS developers. It's a little smaller. Um, 17,000. One that I found really useful is the JavaScript community. That's where I've gone in and asked people JavaScript questions, and I get a bunch of answers. 146, 413. There's a jQuery mobile community, really small. Might not be that valuable, actually. There's only been 65 posts since I last logged in. This one's had more than 99. So it also tells you how many posts have there been since you last logged in. That could be another way to, for you to decide what's a good community. So. You join all of these communities, but some of them don't post very often. People are not very active. So this one, like the jQuery one, I'm surprised. It's only got 65 posts since I last logged in a few days ago, where these, you know, lots of people post because they're much more active. So I don't recommend that one too much just based on these numbers, but I'll mention it. It's not as vibrant as it should be. They might be off on Twitter or somewhere else. Mobile web dev, 11,000. I was just kind of checking that one out. I didn't see it that valuable. The phone gap one, um, so that one, that one is active, about 3,000 members. Another one that I really like is the web developers, web designers, web coders community. Even though this is a mobile app, it's based on HTML and all those web technologies. So I have gotten good results right there, contributing to that and finding, finding content and learning stuff. So web dev, web designers, web coding. And for such a dedicated team of web designers, that's kind of a pretty lame logo. <laughs> There's another web development one, 77,000 members. There is overlap. Some people are in multiple communities. Sometimes there's a community that has the rule, no cross-posting. 
So that means don't post the same thing on seven communities, on two communities. How do they know that? Again, there are moderators here that have nothing better to do, and they really believe in it, and then therefore they're checking out their members of more than one community probably, and I see, oh, this person posted the same thing three times. Best case scenario, they call you out on it. Worst case scenario, they remove the post, and again, worstest case scenario, they remove you from the community. So be careful about the rules. Use a different name. Use a different name, exactly. Well, I myself do have literally about 12 different email addresses. <laughs> They're not all Gmails, but all of these different ones I've got. Yeah. Hotmail, Gmail, Yahoo Mail, several personal server mails, they all add up. I do actually. Um, I do have a unique password for all of them. And what you and I have a little blog post right here on how to remember them all. <laughs> so if you check out our company, pmdinteractive.com slash blog, and you search for the article on passwords. I've got a short article there on how to remember all your passwords, because I do have a password for every single email address and every single website I visit. And I don't use LastPass or 1Pass or those other password managers for you. I have a system. It's not that I'm smart, I just use a system, uh, and my system is in this blog post right here, a guide to choosing a good password. So if you go to pmdinteractive.com, search for password, you'll get the blog post and a free PDF. And what else? So you can go to the Windows phone. So anyway, that's a bunch of communities there that might be valuable to, to look into. The caveat is follow the rules. The way you actually use it is, let's say, I go over to the... Um, oh, and then there's one more. I don't have it listed here, but there's also, if you simply search Android, you have these, <coughs> these ones right here. And this one of 1.8 million users, that might be one. The, the thing is that I recommend, I recommend it earlier, let me write here, um, tips, uh, get into communities of at least 1,000 users. Uh, you may find a good viable community of 700 people, sure, but the more in there, the more possible people you could reach if you're trying to market your app or if you're trying to get help and that sort of thing. But then there is diminishing returns on the opposite end. What about if you get into a community that's too big? I think these communities of a million users, of 800,000 users, might be too big. So I'm going to say try to avoid big communities. The reason for that is you're going to, get, you're going to be a needle in a haystack. You're going to be drowned out. Everyone's going to be posting a lot. You're going to dr be drowned out. Now, I break that rule all the time. I am a part of a couple of million member communities, and it is valuable, but it's you burn out faster because you post something, and you get some activity out of it, and then 10 things just showed up an hour later. So you have people have to scroll down to find more. Uh, if you're in you know, a 200,000 member community, that's a good medium right there. A lot of people are involved, but not so many people that your stuff gets crowded out. So big, obviously I would define those as the million member communities. There aren't that many of those million members, but there are some of 500,000, 700,000, 800,000. So if perhaps you're getting into 200,000, 300,000, that's a good sized one. But what you also want to do, even with Let's say you find a, found a great community of 3,000 members. You also want to read the rules of the community and follow it. Of course, that's so just read it, follow it, and vet the community. Check out the community. You don't have to click join. Whenever you see a community, you don't have to click join. You can click the icon of the community to actually look at it. And then I want to look around and see what people are posting. And the reason for this is to um, 
read the rules because there might be something right here. Never advertise your own apps. Okay, then there's no point for me to join it, perhaps. Maybe as you look at it, uh, you're, you're going to see, well, people are posting, but people are not active. Uh, you can tell they're active when below the post people have commented, people have liked it. This number here is a like, they call it a plus one. Maybe they shared it. Uh, that's got three likes. That one's got five. If you go to a community and there's posts but no one is following up, it may be a sort of a, you know, a spammy community. People are just posting stuff but no one's serious, no one's caring, no one's moderating it. So vet the community. That is, view the community, check out how active it is, view it, check the content, check how active. If it's got 7,000 people and people are posting, but no one is replying, no one is plus one, plus oneing, no one is active, then it might not be a good community to get into. You'll just be another person talking in an echo chamber. So let's say I've joined a community, and then now, once you join the community, you have the ability to share to the community, to contribute to it. You'll see the, the, the pencil when you're in a community, and it says you're about to post something to this community. You can write whatever text, you can attach pictures, links, locations. So let me show you this. You just uploaded theirs. Uh, okay, uh, mine right here. Um, my app. Remember, I can get the link to my app from Amazon. I'm in this community. I'm going to attach a link. And so I'm about to share it to the community. It took the link. It put a nice. It put the thumbnail. It put a little text. I can write the text and you know advertise it and say hey everyone here's the latest app from us it's amazing you want to download it whatever you want to read the rules can you show off your own apps can you advertise yourself market yourself but then here in theory i'm reaching 247,000 people that doesn't mean you're going to get 247,000 downloads that's always the downside of social media uh, people would say, well, I've got a thousand followers, and if only those one thousand followers were giving me one dollar a month, I'd be raking in an extra thousand dollars income. That never happens, even with people that have ten thousand followers. It's very easy to follow, it's very easy to like or comment, but it's so hard. Suddenly the mouse gets so heavy when you click that buy now button, that download button, that donate button. Suddenly it's very difficult to do that. And I remember reading for all of these years that micropayments are going to revolutionize everything pay a dollar here, pay 50 cents there to get content. It's, we've kind of, you know, it's kind of like the snake eating its tail. We got so used to for so long downloading that free song off Napster. Okay, then we got used to paying 99 cents for it, grudgingly. And then now, you know, you don't, you don't see software of $50 anymore. It's still out there, but everyone's used to the 99, $9.99 app, you know, for an expensive version of the software. Nine, $9.99 is expensive now. Yes. What is, is it better to use your social media as a tool, for example, or like Facebook or whatever, as by itself, or do you try to use it as a way to draw people into your other realms of blogging? You definitely want to use it as a stepping stone. You want to draw people back to your blog in social media. I wouldn't write my whole 100-word blog post here. I would write one sentence of it to entice people, plus a picture, and a link back to the whole 100 words. So most of the time when we do this for companies, that's how we do it. A little snippet, something to catch attention on Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, whatever, to guide them back to the website, back to the blog, back to the, back to the site, and there they can buy or donate or whatever. So always use it as a way to market to go back to your site. When you're 
Yes. The the bigger word is continual content. Uh, you don't have to be writing 500 words every week. You could be doing 100 words every month. That's still going to be better than doing nothing. People that start with a blog are very excited for the first two or three or five posts, and then they get burnt out. So it's better to be regular, to post something once a month, maybe once a quarter. Obviously, it's much better once a week, once a day. Quantity-wise, still quality outweighs that. It's not enough that I'm posting 500 words every week. What is it about? Is it duplicate content? Is it original? So that's a big nuance to talk about, but I'm teaching a blog class very soon, next week actually, and we go into more detail about that. Question? Well, um, back to the book for this, this class, um, just talking about, I mean, the goal would be to become a feature app in one of these platforms. Yeah. And so one of the um, ingredients is how many downloads are you getting and how many, how long are people staying in your app? And so he talks about you know, this is true for anything, but just really making it compelling. So it seems to me if you if you had a really interesting app and you described it well and you had a nice a nice icon, if you put it in this group and it's free, that would that would be a good way to get started. Exactly. And this is the this is the other side of the coin of all of this, that we may think we have a good grasp of the technical aspects of things. But now we've got to start to think about this very intangible aspect of things. My icon, my text that I write here, what do I write? Where do I share it? So so that book focusing on marketing, so I chose it because it's thinking in terms of you've got an app, you've got to get downloads and such. Well now you've got to think like a marketer. You may have programmed it expertly but that's not enough. Uh, how do you also market it? That's why we're touching on this today, but definitely check out that book. What was the, la what was the price on that the last time? It was less than $20. I don't remember. It was worth every penny. Yeah. I went through, with, I mean, it's a, it's a short book. Mm -hmm. It doesn't look like much, but I mean, I had circles and arrows and mm -hmm. exclamation points and notes on every page. Mm -hmm. And I'm going through it again to make my own checklist and my mm -hmm. own strategy. It's very so definitely then it can be applied in the real world here as as we're posting to this community again that icon that i designed <coughs> is going to is going to catch people's uh, attention like right here base recycler view adapter helper add item child click so someone's saying download my app right here but i'm not enticed it's not a very good icon and the description's not good but then someone else over here is going to share um, a much more polished one and that might get you more downloads and these app stores are going to uh, I say all the time in my social media classes and marketing classes popularity breeds popularity so if you're popular you're gonna get more popular if you got downloads you're gonna get more downloads Well, how do I start getting downloads you need to break that cycle at some point and the, and the leg up is to get on social media is to start advertising on social media and one of the most powerful ways is Google Plus communities because uh, Twitter doesn't have communities they're analog is hashtags and that has a whole discussion and Facebook does have groups but how many of you know about Facebook groups raise your, raise your hand one person Facebook has a place where people congregate on a topic very few people know about them very few people use them communities on Google Plus are big we, we can see it here tangibly and it lets you reach an audience very quickly if you if you do it right So this is, a, this is a big kettle of fish to get into, but uh, uh, it's free, and you can learn from it and make mistakes, and um, it, could, it could lead into something good. Uh, you could get a lot of app downloads and, uh, and that sort of thing. So any general questions on marketing or Google Plus? Have any of you um, started to tell friends and family that you've got an app on, on an app store yet? That's a form of marketing too in the real world. Tell them to check out your app on Amazon. So uh, basically we're just about at the end and uh, so looking back on it all in about three months 
uh, we've been uh, we're learning a lot. Let's let's do some quick numbers here. Just some quick random numbers. Uh, we would meet seven um, hours a week for a month. So we were doing about 28 hours a month, and we're here about three months. So we spent approximately, let's round down, 80 hours. We spent about 80 hours learning all of this stuff in this time. There's a website, How Much to Build an App. How much to make an app.com. I don't know if I mentioned it in this class. Did I ever mention it in this class? How to how much to make an app.com? So this is, answers the question. How much does it cost to make an app? We've just spent 80 hours. Okay? So if you check out, there's a little there's a little wizard here for us to figure out how much is our app worth. Because this is more about Someone's going to come to you, let's say, can you build my app? How much is it going to cost? You have no idea how much you're going to charge. Let's check this out. Get started. The question is, okay, is it going to be for Android, iOS, or both? Now, keep looking on the top right corner. I want a multi-platform app. Okay, let's start off with $16,000. Would you like it to integrate email, social media, or none? I want people to be able to use Twitter on it. Okay, 24,000. Do people create personal profiles? No, they're just going to use their Twitter account, so we'll leave it as is. How will you make money? Uh, 99 cent downloads or free, but then you're going to make money in the app uh, or totally for free, or I don't know yet. I'm going to say I'll make it so that people can buy stuff in the app. So add that, 30,000. Do people. Let's say I don't notice it jump really high. Mm -hmm. Hey, that's it. I can go back. Let's check it. I don't know. Uh, no, nope, it stayed the same. Okay. That's more expensive. <laughs> Do people rate or review things? Nope. Does your app need to connect with your website? Yes. That's at 34,000. How nice should your app look? Bare bones, stock, beautiful. Obviously, I want it beautiful. 61,000. Do you need an app icon? Yep. I need the branding for it. Your app estimate is $72,000. <laughs> well, how did they figure that out? Um, somewhere here under about, it says, how'd you get these estimates? These are based on the amount of time it would take to complete the average project with a development cost of $60 to $100 per hour, which is the market rate for quality talent in the U.S. So, this of course can range a lot, but our 80 hours that we spent, let's go on the low end, times $60 an hour. Um, $4,800 at least, right? We spent 80 hours and we're doing $60 for, no, wait, no, that's not right. That's, no, is that? Yeah, that is. It's, yeah, 80 hours. $60 an hour. So if we were then going on the high end and saying we're going to spend 80 hours uh, and we're charging $100, well, that's $8,000. With our level of experience and the kind of app that we worked with and the example here, then with all of that extra stuff that we, that, that we didn't get to, the email sign-in and the user creation and integration with your website, more time, more money. So this estimate here, they should really show it as a range between the $60 to $100. Now, obviously, those prices are for a certain type of quality of design studio that you hire. You can easily also find many other people with different ranges of skills that are doing it for $20 an hour, $7 an hour. Who knows? It really ranges. Also, you got to figure out how many hours each day. Yeah, that's always tricky. I'm assuming you're going to have to back that out. You, you definitely, to be smart, you've got to block it into ranges, and that comes with experience. Uh, this app is going to take between 80 and 120 hours. So on the low end, it might be this much. On the high end, it might be that much. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I got so that I could, when I was creating websites in the early days, I could kind of figure out how long I thought that, that a website should take me to create. And then when I took Joe's class, he said, well, you take that amount, and then 
you can double it or triple it. And then you, you double that. Or something, you end up with nine times what you originally thought. And he said it's usually pretty accurate. Yeah, it, as you get better at all of this, uh, really, I know myself, I always think it's going to be way too short. Yeah. So you can, if you double, if you have the time, then you have to double the cost. Uh, so it's it's pretty. So here's a, yes. The other thing that I mean, I ran into this. I just did the last few months again in a different project that um, you know the construction business has something called uh, change orders, mm -hmm. and that really that concept that really needs to be factored in because you know you, you're figuring out what you're going to do and you kind of start that way. And then halfway through, the customer says, oh, I want it different. Well, because you've already built this foundation, that probably means you have to re-engineer half of what you've already done. Or he thinks it's just something easy. So you really have to be clear about um, any changes. It's going to be a new charge, and you have to see where we are at that point. Yeah, that's why this there's no short answer. And when people always ask, uh, ask me at the end of a class in the web design class, for example, how much would you charge for a website? That, there's no answer to that. You have to talk to the person, what do they want, what do they need, and then there's still going to be a range. So let me pull up this right here, which is which, which is pretty funny. On the left, client expectation versus budget. Mm -hmm. So um, that um, that's a possible range right there. So all of this work that we've done, it's worth at least a few thousand dollars and you got it all out of a free class. So obviously we still have much more that we can learn. This is the end of the sequence. There aren't any more classes, but I recommend take some other classes that we offer at the college. Keep learning on your own. Take the class again. It changes once in a while. Um, you have all the, all the skills to various degrees. It's really up to you to create the kind of app that what you need to do. There's still pieces of the puzzle because everyone needs their own kind of puzzle. Any, yes? I just can't help but all the things that I've, I've uh, if this is my pain, my past pain of doing. So um, if, if uh, somebody asks you for a proposal and they want it detailed, charge for it because you can get really detailed and figure out exactly what they need and write it all out and then they give it to somebody else. Yeah. They just use your specs to save money with somebody else. So charge for specs. Yeah, this is stuff that really, there's a lot of nuances to it, and you learn more of it as you do it, or you get advice. So as we, as we wind things down, again, you, you should just take stock of where we came, where we're at, and where you came from. If you, if you started month one with very little HTML and experience and such. Look how far we've gone. There's still more to learn, of course, but look how far you've gone. You've come. If you started the class with some experience already, if you took the Feud class, you probably still learned a whole lot of things, too. If you took the other Android class, you still probably learned some things. So take stock in that, that you've got an actual app, and we've got all of these tools to keep moving forward. So thank you for taking the class.